Slavery and its Impact on the Health of Caribbean People, Part 2. In Part 1, we learned a little about the diets of West Africans prior to colonization and the advent of the transatlantic slave trade. We learned that it was a diet high in fruits, vegetables, legumes, grains, and for those who lived near the coasts or rivers, rich in fish and other seafoods. We learned that the pre-colonial West African diet was low in salt and sugar, and that alcohol from, for example, fermented honey, was only consumed on special occasions, and the same for meat. But all of that changed on the plantations of the Americas. Part 1 showed how the diet became heavy in starchy carbohydrates and salted fish. Today, we'll take a look at two of the other most significant changes, changes which continue to impact our health today. Sugarcane offered two main products, sugar and rum, and our ancestors learned to develop a taste for both. In fact, this taste was encouraged by planters. Many gave their enslaved both rum and sugar or molasses as part of their daily rations. Sugar, like the starchy carbs such as yams and sweet potatoes, could help power a day outside in the fields, cutting cane, hoeing, or whatever was being done. Do you remember some of our parents and grandparents talking about being given a cup of sugar water as children and sent off to school? That practice arose in slavery. Some planters would dilute the sugar in water and dole out the mixture every day at breakfast, or they would give the enslaved a ration of sugar every week and encourage them to drink the sugar water before leaving their huts. Our ancestors began adding sugar to everything, from tea to soup. Sugar even provided a source of income for the many women who became sweet sellers. Sugar cakes, nut cakes, tulum, etc. were and are made of high amounts of sugar or molasses. And every Caribbean child is familiar with the special or the freco, mostly just sugar and ice. Now we like sugary drinks and sodas. Sugar became a dominant part of our diet, but we now know that it causes diabetes and contributes to obesity and other conditions which affect many of us in the Caribbean today. The everyday consumption of alcohol by our ancestors is also rooted in the plantation. Our ancestors were made to produce the rum and were made to drink it. Many planters gave the enslaved rum rations every day or weekly, as we can see from this slide. This rum was supposed to make them happy, more pliable, less likely to rebel. Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist who himself had been a slave, saw right through it. What is tragically ironic is that the rum made by the enslaved in the Americas was then taken to West Africa and traded there for more captives. One estimate suggests that rum was used in payment for about 10% of the enslaved taken from the continent. Vintage labels like these point to the association between slavery and rum production, an association none of the Caribbean's rum brands admit or acknowledge today. Like sugar, alcohol is an addictive substance and the Caribbean's con alcohol consumption rates are now among the highest in the world, resulting in several health and social consequences, including traffic accidents, homicides, domestic violence, liver and heart disease, and various forms of cancer, such as breast and colon cancer. Much of the health status of Caribbean people today was birthed during the plantation era and was then complicated by what we think of as development. <clears throat> For example, the high starch, high sugar diets are now complicated by the fact that many of us are now fairly sedentary. We sit at our desk or at our jobs all day and then sit in front of our televisions for a couple hours before going to sleep at night. Where before we walked everywhere, the advent of cars and buses has meant that we rarely walk anywhere. We still have the same starchy, sugary diets of our foreparents, but we don't burn off those calories anymore. We can turn all of this around, however. Governments can mandate labels on foods to help consumers make healthier choices and can ramp up their public health education programs on nutrition. 
Physical exercise could be increased in schools to maybe three hours a week, and more community organizations could be encouraged to form around health and wellness. Warning labels can also be placed on alcohol products and governments can restrict the advertising and promotion of alcohol. They can also restrict the hours of sale and try to find alternative ways for people to make money other than by opening yet another rum shop. This policy document provides a sobering look at alcohol trends in Latin America and the Caribbean and suggests ways governments can address the myriad issues raised. I hope you've enjoyed this two-part series. Please look out for other videos in the future.